Our story shape us, but our past mistakes do not define us. In worship, we open ourselves to God's work within us today. We come ready to be molded into who we might become. Let us worship the one who draws us always into new life. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing from the Faith We Sing, number 2223. They'll know we are Christians by our life. Raise them high. Raise them high. How many of you have a voice? 
then you can all be in choir. Because Betty is in the job of working miracles. Amen? Amen. 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 Betty can save any of you. Uh, all right, so I bring to your attention. All right, so I did say that choirs next week will be their last week until fall, so please come out and join them. Women's Bible study is also completed until September. I invite you to go online, get an app. If you need a study over the summer, devotions, please let me know. I'll provide them for you. Um, and then get ready for that to come back in September as well. What else is going on in our bulletin? Uh, oh, well, fun times, church council. Um, if you'd like to join us on Tuesday and see the inner workings of the church, please come on out Tuesday night. We have uh, missions night is on the 20th. We're doing kits. Our food pantry collection last month in May. That was last, just last month, right? <laughs> last month we did desserts. For this month, June, we are preparing for July. So we are doing lunch snacks. Um, how many of you have children? How many of you know children? How many of you know anyone that's received a free breakfast or lunch at the school? Does anyone know anyone that receives Michelle in the schools North Northfield? Yes, in Northfield. You know, we have children and families in our community that receive breakfast and lunch at school. There's a state act, and it actually increased over $50,000 this year in January of 2024, so that over 100,000 children are eligible. 100,000 children need help with breakfast and lunch. So we're going to help that because school ends in June, and so for July and August, they're home. So if you can, you know, bring in anything that's in here, kids' lunch items, even if it's kids' breakfast items, the little cereal cups or stuff like that, applesauce, spaghettios, I don't know what they eat, goldfish. <laughs> My son eats Ritz crackers, so I don't know, just a whole sleeve of Ritz crackers, and he's a happy kid. So whatever you can do, please help support that mission. Whew. Always good stuff going on. I think that's it. New members fire, I think we're good to go. Right. Thank you so much. At this time, I am here to usher, excuse me, to come forward and prepare for our collection. Thank you. 
You may be seated. Let us all bow our heads in prayer. Blessed Lord, who caused all the holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. May God's blessing be upon the reading and hearing of these words. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there, were there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who have called on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, <coughs> the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and, it was, and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Take a moment and pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath, my mouth with your message. Let all that I say, let all that I do bring honor and glory, Lord, to you and to you alone. In the name of Jesus, I ask. Amen. Amen. So I want to share a story to start with today <clears throat> about a gentleman named Charles Spurgeon. You may have heard of him. He grew up in England and uh, with great spiritual heritage. His father was a preacher. His grandfather was a preacher. His great-grandfather was, guess what? A preacher. His great-great-grandfather was a preacher. So with such a legacy, he knew the gospel from a very early age. And he said this, he said, the light was there, but I was blind. He said, for years as a child, I tried to learn the way of salvation. Had I ever read my Bible? Yes, of course. Had I ever been taught by Christian people? Yes, of course. I had been taught by my mother. Times. And yet somehow it was a new revelation to me that I was supposed to believe it and live it. Charles Spurgeon was your typical church kid, knowledgeable in the Bible in his head but lacking the knowledge of God in his heart. Then one snowy January day when Spurgeon was about 15 years old, he was on his way to worship at church. But a snowstorm proved to be way too much for him. 
and he didn't make it to his destination. And so instead, he saw this little primitive Methodist church, a little chapel along the way. So he decided to join them for worship. There were dozens, there were a dozen or 15 people at most at this worship service. So the regular pastor wasn't there either because of the snowstorm. So a very thin looking man with a very feeble voice was going to preach that day. He was probably a bit unprepared as he wasn't anticipating being the preacher that day. But in the absence of the pastor of the church, he did his best. His text came from Isaiah 45, 22, which says, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. That's it. And here's his testimony of what, what really happened to him. The preacher began by saying this, my dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed, but it says look. Now look doesn't take a great deal of work. It doesn't take a great deal of pain. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It's just look. Well, a man needn't go to college to learn how to look. You might be the biggest fool in the world, but you can still look. A man needn't be worth a thousand a year to be able to look. You can tell how long ago this was, right? Anyone can look, even a child can look. But then the text says, look unto me. I, he says in this broad Essex um, language, he said, many of ye are looking to yourselves, but ain't no use looking there. You'll never find any comfort in yourself. You must look unto Christ. The text says, clearly, look unto me. Then the good man followed up his text this way. Look unto me, I am sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me, I am hanging on that cross. Look unto me, I am dead and buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me as I ascend to heaven. Look unto me, I am sitting at the Father's right hand. O poor sinner, look unto me. Look unto me. His message only lasted about 10 minutes, and Spurgeon said that after those 10 minutes, he was at the end of his tether. With only a dozen people in the pews, the preacher looked directly at Spurgeon, knowing that he was a stranger. He then addressed him and said, young man, you look miserable, and you will always be miserable. <coughs> miserable in life and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Then, as Spurgeon said, this preacher lifted up his hands and shouted, Young man, look unto Christ. You have nothing to do but to look and live. I saw at once the way of salvation, he says. I know now, I know not what else he said. I did not take much notice to anything else. I was so possessed with that one thought, to look. Like as when the brazen serpent was lifted up and the people only looked and they were healed. So it was with me, he says. I had been waiting to do 50 things, but when I heard that word look, that one simple word, what a charming word it seemed to be. I looked until I could almost <clears throat> have looked my eyes away. Then and there the cloud was gone, the darkness has rolled away, and at that moment I saw the sun, and at that moment I knew. Later that year, he preached his very first sermon, because at that moment he was converted. And then giving <clears throat> his gifting was obvious to all with that first sermon he preached. When he was 18 years old, he took his first official pastoral job. When he was 20, he was called to be a minister of the historic New Park Street Chapel in London, which then grew to be the largest church in London, where he ministered for decades. Spurgeon went on to be known as the prince of all preachers. It all started when the snow diverted him into a small church meeting amongst total strangers. This conversion story shows us what God can do, and he can do it in an instant. How the Lord can turn a sinner to himself and use him greatly. 
The preacher was unknown to Spurgeon throughout the rest of his life. He never saw that man again. Yet the Lord used this stranger, this, this man, to direct Spurgeon to the Lord, who in turn impacted millions and millions of people. Who is God using you to impact today and tomorrow? Our reading today talks about the greatest conversion story. <clears throat> it is the famous story of the conversion of Saul from Tarsus. This story is told many times, <clears throat> probably more times than any other conversion story. It's told in our reading today in Acts chapter 9, but then if you read the book of Acts, it's actually repeated again in chapter 22. And then it's repeated again in chapter 26. And then further, this conversion story um, is, is alluded to in Galatians 1 and Philippians and 1 Timothy. And finally, this story is the conversion to extremes, it sure is. From the greatest enemy of the church, he becomes the greatest advocate for the church. Saul became a very great saint, one who labored more than all the other apostles, one who planted churches and discipled many. He wrote nearly a quarter, actually 23.5% of the New Testament. So I want to look closely at today's verses to see what we can learn from them. He's on the road to Damascus. <clears throat> this is the road that Saul is traveling when he encounters the Lord. This is parallel to that primitive Methodist chapel that we talked about where Spurgeon first looked to Christ. What brought Spurgeon to the chapel was a storm. What brought Saul to this road was his intense hatred of Christ. Saul was his Hebrew name, but we know that Paul was his Greek name. And we read in the first verse, but Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord. So how vile must his heart have been? Tell you how vile. When Stephen was stoned for preaching the gospel, Saul was there at the actual event. Now he didn't, he didn't throw the stones physically, but he was there, he witnessed it, and he approved of that execution. Saul continued ravaging the church and entering house after house, dragging men and women and committing them to prison. Saul such was filled with so much hatred towards those who followed Jesus. He didn't merely disdain them in his heart, nor did he simply speak against them with his mouth. He actively pursued them with his feet. He hunted them down, brought them to prison as heretics, where they were beaten and perhaps killed because of their faith. This is what made Saul's actions so vile. He got it exactly wrong. He went after God's people, thinking he was doing God's work, but he was really doing the work of the devil. In the continuing verses that Saul, still breathing these threats, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, he had a right to bound them and bring them to Jerusalem. Just think of how difficult this would have been. You're going to travel north for a week, and then when you find any following the way of Jesus, you're going to capture them, bind them with handcuffs, and force them to come with you back south to Jerusalem, where you can turn them over to the high priest so they can be persecuted. The effort and the intensity on display here shows how Saul's heart was so hardened and filled with hate. But no matter how hard a heart is, God can soften it. And he can soften it in an instant. We go on with verse 3 where Saul went on his way and he approached Damascus. And suddenly this light from heaven shone upon him. This was a divine light, a light sent from God. How? We have no idea. That's not the important part, but it was miraculous. Yet Saul, approaching the city, found himself engulfed in this great light. 
Isn't it interesting here that, that God waits for Saul to get near to Damascus? God could have brought this light when Saul was three steps out of Jerusalem, and he could have brought it when he was a day's journey into this trip. But God didn't do that. He waited until Saul approached Damascus. God let Saul stew on his evil deeds for 140 miles. <clears throat> if he was walking, it would have taken him maybe seven days. That's a long time to be stewing over all your hatred and allowing it to build up in you. But God was showing his patience to Saul. God was allowing Saul to see and understand the depth of his own sin. So also today when God breaks in upon the life of any sinner, he doesn't always do it the way we think maybe he should do it. He'll often let people stew about their sin. Let them think about it. Let them reflect on it. And then hopefully they will understand the depth of what they're doing. And then understand the depth of God's grace. Not only did Saul see a light, but he also heard a voice. A voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But what a great question. Saul thought he was on the side of God, but really he was going against the ways of the Lord. This question was really exposing Saul's real actions. Jesus is showing his solidarity with all who follow him. To persecute a follower of Jesus is to persecute Jesus himself. That's because we are members of the body of Christ. You harm a believer and you're harming Jesus. Think about that with your actions and your words to others. When you harm another, you are harming Jesus Christ. When Saul was persecuting the church, he was persecuting Jesus. Now Saul didn't understand this right away. He didn't even know that it was Jesus that was talking to him. And that's why he questions in verse 5, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus. You are persecuting me. Certainly the words had to hit him like a ton of bricks. Here was Saul thinking he's doing the Lord's business only to find out that he truly was persecuting Jesus. And at this point, Saul's world, I'm sure, was rocked. Saul's head must have been spinning with confusion, trying desperately to understand what it all meant. Jesus didn't let Saul think about it too long, but he gave him some very clear directions. Rise and go into the city, and you'll be told there what to do. The city of Damascus, he was close by after all. Remember, Jesus didn't appear to him until he approached Damascus. In actuality, Saul could do nothing less than this anyway, for the light had blinded him. Now they're traveling, and the men that were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose, rises from the ground, and although his eyes are wide open, he can't see. And they led him by hand and brought him into the city. And all of these in all of these events show miraculous things were to be done. Everyone who had been traveling with Saul heard the voice and saw the conversion that followed. But Saul was the only one blinded by its light. It's not likely that they all experienced some sort of solar flash or meteor explosion or some other bright object. The light was directed by God to Saul because God was pursuing Saul. This brings us to understand that conversion is supernatural. It's a miracle when anyone turns to Jesus because we are all born <clears throat> with sinful hearts, which naturally live in rebellion against the Lord. And we are incapable of changing ourselves. We need God to work in our hearts. Jesus said that we need to be born again. Saul describes conversion as being a, like a new creation. We can't do this by ourselves. We need God to intervene, to soften our hearts, to open our eyes, to change us from all the way deep inside, 
All of that is the miraculous work of God. Now, the Lord doesn't always do this with a blinding light or a voice from heaven. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this was the only conversion that happened that way. There are times when the Lord uses maybe a thin-looking, feeble-voiced speaker on a snowy day to preach for 10 minutes. There are times when the Lord uses a financial crisis or a near-death experience to turn people to Christ. There may be times when God uses you or me. We don't know, but we must be ready. The Lord does work in mysterious ways. I read some articles in this book called Passing by the Field. It's a collection of short observances of life as it relates to spiritual truths. And the one that really stuck to me was one that's called The Righteous Need a Miracle. And it goes like this. Christians who grew up attending church and believing in Christ at a young age often feel that their testimony is boring. They lack a dramatic story of Jesus miraculously doing something out of the dark and sinful past that they have. They are sorrowful that they can't tell a similar story of the power of God to save them from their sin. But there is no need to despair. The author says this, I went to high school with a friend who couldn't have been more opposite than I was. I grew up in a loving, stable, church-attending family. The path to following Christ was natural for me. My friend, on the other hand, grew up in a home full of problems, drug addictions. And in this drug addiction, he describes his drug problem to me, and he said, I wasn't high on drugs all the time, only while I was awake. He went to college, and he found Christ, who forgave him for all his sins. He went on to seminary and now serves as a pastor. I remember well the time he came to my home for lunch. He gave me a great perspective on my salvation and his salvation. And he said, Steve, it's not a miracle that I became a Christian. My life was so messed up. I needed help. I searched hard for that help, and I found it in Jesus. But you, my friend, you needed a miracle. You had everything you could have ever wanted in your earthly family. You had parents who loved you, siblings who were loving and supportive. You had sufficient financial resources. In the earthly sense, you had no need for Jesus. Your life was great. You had no reason to search for him. It's a miracle that you recognized through all of that that you still had a need for a savior. After hearing my friend's description of my salvation, I was encouraged afresh at God's working in my life. It was indeed a miracle that he opened my eyes to see my need for him. You know, <clears throat> Jesus said it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus didn't come to save the self-righteous Pharisee. He came to save the one deep in his sin. Certainly, it's a miracle when those who are engaged in great sin turn to Christ. But it's also a miracle whenever a righteous person turns to Christ. If you've grown up in a church and have loved Jesus from an early age, I hope that this perspective encourages you to tell your miraculous story of God's grace in your life. The question comes naturally to you this morning, have you been converted? Have you experienced the miracle of new birth? Are you a new creation? Have you looked at Christ and to Christ as Spurgeon did? If we move on um, in our story to Acts 9, uh, chapter, verse 9, it says, and for three days he was without sight, he didn't drink or he didn't eat. Three days he was confused and he fasted and he prayed and he sought the Lord. And as he did, God was working. God was working. And then we have an Ananias who comes into our picture. And he calls, he's called by the Lord and he says, you know, here I am. And then we're told that this Ananias, now Ananias was a very popular name back in the time. So this Ananias is different from others that you read about. He was a very obscure man, and 
much like the thin, feeble voiced layman who preached at that chapel so long ago to Charles Spurgeon. All we know about this man is this one small story. But we know he was a believer, a follower of Jesus, and the Lord did appear to him in the vision. And oh, can you imagine the Lord telling you, I want you to go and see Saul? Now, Ananias knew that Saul was villainous. He knew what he was doing. He knew that he was capturing people and having them put in prison and beaten. He knew all this. And Ananias is protesting the Lord. Like, Lord, I know this man. I'm not going anywhere near him. And the Lord says, Ananias, I know your concerns, but I have a plan for Saul's life. I'm going to use him in great ways. He will spread the gospel far beyond Damascus. I know he's the one persecuting my people now. But that's about to change. So Ananias did as he was told. <clears throat> Saul actually had two conversions that day, one physical and one spiritual. And from that moment on, Saul became a mighty warrior for Christ. He preached Jesus in Antioch and Lystra and Philippi and Thessalonica and Athens and Ephesus and Corinth all over. He became a warrior in a moment. It all happened at his conversion. We may feel like we are defined by the high points or the low points in our life, but first and foremost, you are defined by God's love for you. And God's love promises, promises to redeem us. God's love allows us to look back over our lives and, and see all of our experiences, the good ones, the bad ones, and the, the in-between ones and how they can shape and clarify our purpose. Positive and negative experience shape who we are, how we think about ourselves and think about the world around us. And we all carry baggage of some sort, and we may be tempted to let that baggage define who we are, but we cannot. We cannot. We must learn to define ourselves simply by God's love, not by anything else. Do not let this world tell you you are any less than because of anything you've done in the past. You cannot define yourself by how much money you have or don't have. You cannot define yourself by your social status or your self-image. Do not let this world tell you you are less than anything. Mostly, do not let a scale define who you are. Do not let anything trap you in those thoughts. When you look in the mirror, you should see that beautiful child of God that you are. And the one and only thing that defines you is God's love for you. Amen? Amen. Just take a moment and pray with me, please. The prayer that Jesus taught us so long ago. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Pastor Nicole, come on down. Here, the next contestant. They come running. Come they on, come from the camp. <laughs> I've already got one bruise this morning. <laughs> There's nothing like a good celebration here at Good Shepherd, right? Amen. Can you times that by four? Because we have four really good reasons to celebrate today. Semi, as known to her cool friends, 
is an Exmoor Township High School graduate. She'll be attending Stockton University for nursing this fall, correct? Yes. Yeah. All right. Matthew Walden. Matthew is an Oakcrest High School graduate. He'll be attending Arizona State University for Aerospace Engineering this Ooh. fall. <laughs> Connor Upward. Yo. Connor's been there, done that. He just graduated Widener University with a degree in Civil Engineering. <laughs> now, many of you in front here, you don't show up every Sunday, and that's okay. But I hope you've felt over the last years how much we've been praying for all of you, baking for many of you in college, and you know, each year we remember you, we pray for you, and you might not be here, but this is your family and you're stuck with us. <laughs> and we love you no matter what. We are so proud of you and we're so excited to be able to celebrate this day with you. So I would like if you can come a little to here to there, Pastor Carol, if you can come down because we're gonna pray over them. Gracious God. Thank you for our seniors and this graduation Sunday. Jace, Sunny, Matt, and Connor. As your classes and grading are now complete, may you strive towards excellence in all that you do. As the speeches conclude, may your voices rise up to pronounce justice and peace in the world. As the fanfare cease, may you sing of joy even in the dark and lonely places. As the applause quiet, May you celebrate and lift up those around you. As you graduate, may your achievements grow and cause growth in your communities. And may we all know of the overwhelming blessings of the one who created all things. I now ask if the parents or family of these graduates can please step forward with them. If you can please lay hands on your graduate and the graduates around them, please. The crowd's coming. It's all good. It's family, right? <laughs> Church, I ask you to raise your hands towards these graduates and their families. Holy Father, Thank you for all you have done and are doing and will continue to do in and through Jace, Semra, Matthew, and Connor. Thank you for your word that calls them and us into a mindset of cooperation. Thank you that even as you are working, we can be working too. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit that we might use this day and every day to work out our own salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. We have a little something, something for each of you. Matthew. Matthew.
especially our graduates, that you realize that you are Christ created you to be and how you are defined by his love for you. May we all remember that as we go forth this week. Amen. Amen.